What we're going to do today is we're going to demonstrate uh, how to extract the otoliths out of, in this case, a bluefin tuna, but it applies for all tuna species. So if you want to take the otoliths out of blackfin, yellowfin, big eye, yellowfin, whatever it is, any tuna species, um, you can do so using this method. So the way that we set this up is to give you an idea where the otoliths are. If you look at the back of the head, we'll give you reference points for where you need to cut. So here's the, verte here's the vertebral column or the backbone of the fish. Just above that, you're gonna see a, usually a small little opening. And when you make your cut on the back side of the fish, you wanna do so with the blade going across the top of this opening. If you cut down here towards the base of the skull, you cut right through the otoliths and you destroy them. So again, if you wanna cut, looking at the back of the head, you wanna do so right across the top here. And then from a side profile, you want to match that cut up across the back, across, sorry, across the top of the eye about a half an inch. If you cut the, the head off of the tuna and you're in the recreational uh, permit category, you want to make sure, or the commercial category for that matter, if you can, you want to try to leave about two inches of space between the back of the eye and the back of the, the, back of the cut. If you don't and you cut it up here, again, what you'll do is you'll cut right through that cavity and you'll destroy the otoliths. Um, so what we'll do is we'll make a little cut. To cut through here, you can use any number of things. You can use a sawzall. We have big electric meat saws. Today I'm just gonna use a standard uh, wood saw, which works just fine. And the easiest thing to do, because the, the skin around the head is very tough, you wanna usually make some sort of a primary cut or incision with a knife. And this will give you a good starting point. You can kind of just do that, just enough to get the saw in there and get it going. And then, again, you want to line it up. I'll see if I can go kind of to the side here. Um, and just start off nice and easy. We're going to make the cut so that we come down across the whole head, and then we're, going to, we're basically going to unfold the top of the head and expose the otoliths. kind of get that. It's a little awkward, but you kind of have to get that first cut right where you want it. And then once you get it started, you can start cutting a little bit, a little bit faster. And again, you can see the cut, we're going just above that opening to ensure that we don't cut through the otoliths themselves. Get about three quarters of the way through. You can pull the saw out and you can try to snap the top of the head off. So kind of just put your hands in here and pop the top of the skull open and cut it a little bit more. Make it easy. open and now what you have access to is uh, the brain cavity and the otoliths which the easiest way to find the otoliths is once you've split the once you've cut the top of the head off and folded it over you want to look for the semicircular canals they kind of look like clear uh, partially cooked spaghetti they're round tubes kind of rubbery and again more or less clear you can kind of see through them when you find those tubes that's the location of the otolith. So here's one on the left side of the head. And then we'll look for the other one on the other side. And then here's one on the, the other side. You have to scrape all of this tissue off the top. 
just like this to kind of clean things out to give yourself an idea of where you are in the head. Uh, this will, right now we're just kind of scraping out the brain. That's more, a lot of the brain material there. And once we get once we get this material cleaned out, it'll give us a little bit better view of the inside of the, the skull. The otoliths follow the semicircular canals. The otoliths are going to be housed in two small hollows, one here and one here. It almost looks like someone's taken a drill bit and sort of drilled two perfect holes in the back of the skull. Follow those down and the otoliths will be sitting right at the base. The otoliths are going to be encased in a, in a small, very clear membrane. And when you pull them out, you want to be very careful that you don't actually grab the otolith. What you want to do is try to grab the membrane. The otoliths have a consistency like, like glass. They're a very fragile crystal. If you grab them even slightly aggressively with forceps, you break them in half. And um, it doesn't make them unusual, unusable, but um, we try to keep them intact as best we can. Okay. So, my head's going to get in the way here for a minute, but... Okay, there's part of the canal. There's the other part of the canal. So this is what you're looking for. You're looking for these structures. Again, like little pieces of spaghetti. They kind of, uh, they're kind of clear and very rubbery. Find these, you can find the otoliths. So now that we've removed those, there's a little bit more material that we need to get rid of. in the back of the skull. And once we do that, the otolith is right, right here, right at the tip of those forceps. You can almost see it. You can almost see it sticking out. Take the forceps, grab the edge of the membrane, just twist it around a little bit like that. Nice and easy, nice and easy, nice and easy. And out they come. And so this is the otolith on the right side of the head. And you'll see that it kind of looks, it's kind of, un, you know, you can't really see it very well. And that's because it's encased in a membrane. You can either keep the otolith like this, or if you'd like, you can remove the membrane, kind of like peeling a piece of fruit, where you just gently grab the otolith and then using a pair of tweezers you can buy at CVS or forceps, you can just peel that membrane right off the otolith. Takes a, takes a second or two to get because you want to be very careful you don't rip break the otolith. But once you get it off, you have a much better idea of what you're looking at. So this is the structure that we're after. Um, the reason why the otoliths are so important for tuna fisheries as well as many other fisheries around the world is that using this structure we're able to estimate the age of this fish and then if we can age enough fish annually what we're able to do is we're able to establish age length keys and we can assign ages to all of the fish in the catch. Second to that, at least with tuna, um, some of the, the methods developed by Dave Secor and, and Jay Rooker at the University of Maryland have allowed us to actually take the otoliths, section them right straight across like this, a transverse section across the otoliths, and looking at the otolith chemistry, we can determine where this particular fish, in this case, was, was, was spawned. So it'll give us a signal based on water chemistry from, say, the Gulf of Mexico, or water chemistry from the Mediterranean Sea. And this is very important, at least for bluefin, because of the way that the stocks are managed and the amount of mixing that, that occurs. So again, a piece of the fish that is normally thrown away, um, either onshore or offshore, holds a very valuable piece of information at the, at the, uh, the base of the skull. And the otoliths are really important because a lot of the inputs that I just spoke about are used for assessment purposes. And the more of these that we can get, the better the assessments are going to be and the more refined the, uh, the, the projections are going to be for how many fish we have out there and how much we can take. Uh, so that's one otolith right there. We'll put that guy down. And then we'll go after the other one. And again, when you find one, it's very easy to find the other one. The complement is just right on the other side of the skull. Find that hollow section. Again, here's the semicircular canals. We're going to just kind of pop those out. That gives us our reference point where the otoliths are. 
and then it's a little difficult to see but right there right deep inside the skull is the other otolith and the part in case you weren't able to see the part that's sticking up is actually this point so it's very it's it's the small end of the otolith that's sticking up not the larger base end and again we can just grab a hold of that membrane give it a little bit of a tug nice and easy and the otolith will pop right out again take the otolith just hold it in your hand really gently use the forceps and you can peel membrane right off the fish uh, excuse me right off the otolith just like that when you get good at it as long as you have a halfway decent saw you can probably pull the otoliths out in three or four minutes so even though it looks like a, a cumbersome and a difficult task you get very good at it very quickly you probably only have to cut one or two and anybody can sample these it doesn't take any special techniques or tools you basically can just cut the head open with things that you can buy at the hardware store or at the pharmacy or things that we can supply for you. And again, you'll be able to provide extremely valuable scientific data just by taking out these structures that would ordinarily be thrown to the bottom of the ocean or, or put, in the, put in the garbage. So that's the second one that comes out. And then that's it. Um, the, other, the other pieces of, of data that are very helpful for us is if you can give us a measurement of the fish. For tunas, we typically measure from the snout of the fish along the body contour to the fork in the tail, often referred to as curved fork length. So take the otoliths out, measure the fish, a date of when you caught it, and a general area of capture. Again, most people are somewhat reluctant to give out the exact locations. We don't necessarily need the exact locations, but if you can, for example, here in the Gulf of Maine, tell us that you caught it on the northern end of Jeffries, or Wildcat, or on the Kettle Bottom, it provides us with some very good information, even at that sort of little bit broader spatial scale that we can use to look at how catch locations and con uh, composition of the catches are changing uh, in our area and in other areas. And that's it, pretty easy.